when you hear Chris Heller do his his script, um, there's a part of prospecting that you can break down into four components. And when you can keep these components in mind, it sort of helps, um, it kind of helps keep your focus too. So the four C's of prospecting, let's step back a, a, for a sec. What, what exactly is prospecting to everybody? Just searching for leads. You're at its simplest level, it's a conversation. Okay, so think of it as that um, is creating a type of personal connection and creating a purposeful relationship. But at its simplest part, it's just a conversation, and so it happens in four simple steps. Yeah. I was just going to say that um, I think it's important. Uh, like in the first 10 seconds when you meet someone, just to try to find a way to engage that person. Um, because I found that as soon as people know that you're a real estate agent, they, they may just say, you know what, I, I'm having dinner now or I'm talking on the phone. So I, I don't know, I, like I want to fine tune that first 10 seconds. And, and that's exactly what we're about to talk about. Okay, sorry. Okay? No, no, I, I, that was a great segue. I couldn't find it better. So it is a conversation, and it's a conversation that has four components to it. You want to capture them, you want to connect, you want to close, and you want to cultivate them. Does that make sense? So a, building bus a business building conversation aims to achieve three goals. You want to get an appointment, you want to get a referral, and you want to strengthen the relationship. So it's not like a used car salesman where you're just going at them. And when I use the term close, I know that can make the hair stand up on the back of some people's necks. But it's, it's how you direct that conversation by giving them something of value to them to get them to feel like they relate to you and want to work with you. So if you break it down into the four C's, um, capturing is, is exactly what it says. It's basically the goal of building a database is to capture as many haven't met as possible and turn them into mets really quickly and then turn those mets into repeat referral business. One of the best ways to do this is to leverage your mets through what we call prospecting or having conversations with them. Um, and that's why I said, I think I said it the first day we were here, this database that you're building is not a list of names. It's a list of relationships. So don't populate it just with a whole bunch of names because it's not going to help you. They have to be relationships that you can nurture and move along. And the way you move them along is by connecting with them and closing them. So. You need to refine your skills by contacting them consistently to figure out what works for you and how you're able to move them along. And what might be the best way to look for opportunities to service them? Keep them updated on stuff, giving them valuable information. Um, yeah. And the best, that, that's valid, that's valid. And this is a skill that I know I need to work on a lot too. But the best way to do that is to ask them questions and listen to the answer. Right. Because they will tell you. It's not, you know, I have this and I have that. I guess you want to give them something of value. But in order to connect to them, they have to feel like you care. And the only way you know how to care for them is if you ask them the questions that where they tell you what's important to them. So on page 20, there's a whole bunch of connecting questions. And it's basically the who, what, where, when, and why, and how. So if you want to get their details to add it to a database, you can ask questions like, you know, why don't you tell me a bit about your family, or what they're up to right now, or what you're doing, or how your job is. Um, if you want, and this comes back to your question, Simon, about, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move in like a month. Um, and you want to assess their needs, 
you know, what what do you want to do, and you know, why is that important to you? You know, you said you're going to move. You know, have you thought about this a lot, or is it just kind of a person? You've got to ask the questions. Right. Um, that's basically what the conversation is, and that's how you connect. That's the number one best way to do it. Scripts aside, you'll notice the scripts all have questions in them. Focus on listening and asking questions. And then you can deviate from the script to ask another question because you have to be really clear on what it is they want or you can't help them. Um, now the topic of clothes, because a lot of people, they'll have these great conversations and then you leave, but you didn't achieve anything. And you don't achieve anything until you close. And closing is actually the process of asking for business. It's not slamming the sale down the throat. It's just being comfortable asking for business. And there's actually 10 ways to close a conversation. And that's on page 21. I'm going to read them all. I'm going to read them fairly quickly. And then I want each of you to tell me which scenario or which type of close you relate to the best. Okay? So the first one is a hard close. That's me. The second one is a soft close. I really enjoyed visiting with you. When would you like to get together to discuss this further? The third one is a direct close. Can we meet today or would tomorrow be better? Then there's the indirect close. Would it be okay if I got you some information to look over and then we can meet to discuss? The trial close. I think you would agree that we've gone over enough today that a meeting would be our next step. The assumptive close. It sounds like we should meet. I'm available most times this week. What works best for you? The negative positive close. Would you be offended if I asked if we could meet to go over this? <laughs> the take back close. <clears throat> I've really enjoyed visiting with you. To be honest, I'm not sure if I can be of help to you or not. But I would be honored if we could meet to find out. The tie down close. Wouldn't it make sense for us to meet in the next day or so? And the alternative choice close. What works better for you? Meeting today or sometime this afternoon or tomorrow morning? Number three. <laughs> so you like number three, the direct oh, yeah, that's a good question in there. Yeah. I like ten. There's no right or wrong answer. They all achieved the same thing. But a lot of sales, which is what we're in, other than lead generating, is how you use your words and how you get to your objective and how you build those relationships. Because people will only work with people who, who they think know, trust, and care about. So pick a style that's yours and just make sure that that's what you learn to master to get that result. And that's where when you're looking at the script, when you see the close part, if that's not your style of closing, Swap it out for one of these that's just as, as effective that you're comfortable with. The close also depends to some extent on the relationship and the situation, the circumstances. Sure it does. Sure it does. You can't use just one close period on everybody. Exactly. Exactly. So you should have this in an arsenal. Right. You will have one that you find is most effective for you because oftentimes it's the way you present it and how comfortable you are with it. Right. But when you get really good at it and you can start trying other ones, I mean, you can get really complicated about this and look at their disc profile. Are they D people? Do they like numbers? Are they, you know, what's their personality? Because you should match and mirror what their personality is too. So, first off, it's easier to start with what you're comfortable with. But then the next step is to get comfortable assessing people and what their comfort zone is going to be and use the appropriate style for them. Does that make sense? Um, then um, the last thing that we have to do is cultivate them. So even when you do that closing, even when you meet with them, they might not be ready to do something right away. So you don't want all your efforts in generating this lead to disappear because you don't cultivate them. I use the term incubate because it's just kind of what I, I don't know, I started using it. It's the same thing. Um, but when you get to a point where they're not going to do something immediately, you have to have a plan for them 
to incubate them or cultivate them or keep them as a relationship and not just a name on your database. And it's really easy to look at your database and go, I got this in my pipeline, look at all these names. But if you don't actually pick up the phone and talk to them, <laughs> you don't know if you have that business. The only time you really know you have that business is when they've signed a buyer agency or a listing presentation. And if they're not at that stage, you assume they like you, you assume they know you, but the reality is you're going to get slapped in the face when all of a sudden you turn around sometimes and you see that they're listed with someone else. It happens to everybody. No matter how much you try to cultivate your database, you're going to find that people that you thought were yours and that you thought you were cultivating go with somebody else. And this is why I love a lot of the KW courses is because they focus on mindset. And you have to be able to shake that off and say, okay, what do I do with these people? Do I just dump them? And that's how you call your database. You know, if they bought with somebody else, do you dump them? Or do you continue to work with them? And I have... <laughs> And a lot of it is going to be your person, personal relationships. Some people you click with, some people you don't. But I have, I have a story, and I actually just spoke to the guy yesterday. It's sort of a long, convoluted story. I can't even remember how I got him. But, oh, I got him off of a listing. And he came to me and he said, um, you know, I think I really, really want to buy that house. I'm like, oh, okay, great. Um, so you start to qualify them. And he had a house to sell. And it was on the market with another agent. And it had been on the market for a really long time. And I'm like, okay, well, you have this house on the market. Do you need the money from that house to buy this house? And he's like, well, yeah. And I'm like, well, it hasn't sold, so you're not really in a position to buy this house. So, you know, I respect the relationships that you have with the other agent. I'm happy to give you a second opinion if you don't think it's working. But um, I'm also help, happy to help, you know, because that agent, he was in Mississauga, so it was another area. So I'm also happy to help you look and let's, you know, get together, talk about what you're looking for, why you want to move so I can really understand it. And um, once you've sold your house, then we're ready to move. But this house isn't going to work for you because it's going to be sold before your house is sold. So I think, okay, great, I've got an appointment, I'm going in. And if I can get his listing because the other agent isn't doing a good job, bonus for me. But, you know, one way or the other, I can sell him the house when he comes over here. So I go to his house and I meet with him, have a great conversation. I always do some digging about what's not working with the listing. And he's got it listed with a really big agent out there and he's got one of the team members working with him. And the team member isn't even answering his phone calls. Okay, so it's sitting there. So I don't want to disparage the other agent, but I'm like, well, you know, if this was my listing, this is how I would handle it. You've got a listing, it's going to expire soon, you know, talk to me and, and we'll get this sorted out. And then, of course, he throws in, well, the neighbor's also thinking of moving, so I might be, I sort of have another private deal going on with somebody else, because I'm, I'm fed up with this guy, so I had my own lease. I'm like, you know what? I came here to help you with where you're going, not where you are, I can be of service, that's great. So I put him in incubate. I will keep in touch with him, I will talk to him until I know his house is sold, and then we go. And I also thought, okay, I'm going to take him out once, just to get a feel for what he likes, um, and then just to, to cement that relationship. I didn't get a buyer agency signed, okay, because I thought, oh, it's going to be a while, this place hasn't moved, you know, the, there was still a lot left on the contract for him. Before the listing expired, he was still more focused on trying to figure that out. So I took him out, you know, he found another house that he really, really loved. I'm like, you can't buy this house yet. You've got to get the other one sold. So I kept in touch with him. Then I call him, then I'm not getting an answer. I'm not getting an answer. I'm not getting an answer. And I'm like, hmm. Then he finally calls me back and he says, I've been in the hospital. And I'm like, oh, God, I'm so sorry to hear that. What happened? He goes, um, for stress. Oh, my God. And I'm like, oh. He went out on an open house, and instead of getting an agent that looked at his best interest, 
He bought a house that he can't afford and is now on the hook for a million five. Okay? He is so stressed out, he's having breakdowns in front of his kids. He still doesn't have this house sold. And I have a basket case on my hands that I'm not going to get a commission on. I'm like, okay, good. Um, and it's, it's how you want to run your business. So I ended up hand-holding him through it all. He ended up selling it privately. He kept coming back to me like, I've overpaid for this house, and how could this agent do it? I'm going to bring him up to Enrico. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I actually had to keep talking him off the ledge. Then he's like, I don't know if I'm going to keep this house. I might sell it in six months. I don't know if I can afford it. Once the other house was sold, he had a Tesla. I'm going to sell the Tesla, you know, so that I can keep the house. And so I've been keeping in touch with him to see if, you know, he's okay carrying it and the house is okay. I just spoke to him yesterday. He always calls me back. He always answers my contest. He thinks I'm the best agent in the world. So I didn't get any money off of him, one way or the other, on the buy or the sell. But he likes you. But boy, does he like me. <laughs> <laughs> so this would be like your ultimate incubating thing. Yeah. Okay? Mm -hmm. He now has a nice house in the Kingsway. He will sell it in 10 years. I plan on being around in 10 years. In the meantime, I might get I don't know how many clients off of him. That's true. That's very true. So back to the whole cultivate thing. Pick your spots, decide who is important to you, who is good business, because you do only have a limited amount of time, and then figure out how to leverage yourself so that you can keep in touch with as many people as possible with the least amount of work. So what does that look like to you? Question. Mm -hmm. Did your personality fit? Because, I mean, other than the fact that he's stressful and you're not getting anything, because otherwise, there's I just a lot of so bad for him. Yeah. Honestly, it was, a, a, it was a mercy. Spent, right? It was a mercy. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I felt, you know, good about the way I do business. And he knows how I do business, so he's gonna refer me. And would you always, in a case where you get a potential client who's got a listing somewhere else, would you always? Um, provide your thoughts on how you would sell it without not them deciding to like get a future like if this doesn't sell let's do a future listing date okay there's there's two I, I think the best line on that one is I'm always here for a second opinion okay. I have a track record I have a way of doing things that's effective I'm always here for a second opinion now, the second opinion, though, you can't really give what he's in the contract. Not while well, they're so, listed. Right. But I often have cases where someone's buying here, and if they're selling in another area, um, or they're buying here, and they uh, it's mostly when they're selling in another area that they've got another agent. And that's when you have to decide if it's worth either having connections there to be able to refer it to somebody else, that works that area and get 25% off it, or if it's a big enough deal and you're comfortable enough assessing the area and you think your methods will work, taking the listing. Like I sold, I had a, I had a client buy a condo at the James Club and they had a house in Kleinberg and it was worth a million five. And they um, had had agents in the area that were pricing it for them and I said, let me give you a second opinion. And you tell them for information as to where they think it's priced, and then you go and you verify that that price actually makes sense. And then whether you do it or they do it, once once the pricing issue is done, it's about the marketing. And is it worth you trekking up to wherever for that commission? The bigger your pipeline is, the more business you have, it might not be worth it for you. And then you can refer it off. But by asking for a second opinion and building that relationship, you give yourself the option. Does that mean? Okay, so the four C's um, are what? Capture, connect, Capture, close, close, and close. Yeah. close. Yeah. And, 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 yeah. No. Not necessarily. <laughs> um, it's capture, then you talk to them and connect, then you try and close them for the appointment, and then anywhere that goes, you Or you dump them. 
But most of the time, you're trying to build a database of relationships. But there will be times where you just don't. I like somebody. Yeah, or you, it doesn't click, or they're gonna, you feel like they're going to be a nightmare, or for some reason. But that's that's a decision when you go through this process that you make with every single person that you meet. And how often do you do those decision making? I'm going to use the before you go and get to know and Um, I look at a few factors. I look at what the deals were. I look at how I relate to them and they relate to me. Um, and then what I do is I'll, I'll always give, I also think that leads are like rotting fruit. When you first get them, they're keen and you can move it along or you can't. And if you can't, like you've had an appointment with them or you've had two appointments, whatever your, your comfort level is, however much time you want to spend on them, if you feel you can't move them along and all of a sudden you discover they're not moving for six months or a year, something's happened, was that relationship strong enough to circle back to? Then you put them in the incubate, and I find that we have a downtime, you know, in July, and we have a downtime in December. So every six months, I go back to all the people that I'm incubating, I reach out to them, I figure out if they're going to do something next season, and then I assess whether I'm going to dump them. And if I've gone back to them five or six times, because I do this on a consistent basis, and then I realize, okay, they really don't know what they're doing, or I don't like working with them, or it's not that important to me. I will dump them. So I do it sort of twice a year. Yeah, because you want to keep those needs relevant. <laughs> it depends on the relationship you've had with them, whatever your criteria is. But you have to call your database um, to keep it relationship driven at least once, if not twice a year. And I always tend to do it one with Fighter, December and July, August. That makes sense? Okay, sphere of influence. Now we're going to talk about okay, um, where to get business from once you've called all the people that you're comfortable with. So you're always going to have an inner circle of people that you look to more often. And those become like your A-plus referral people. Because you want to start making a list of everybody you know and then figuring out how you're going to connect with everybody they know. Because then it's unlimited. It's exponential. If you get in the habit of being able to keep going out and out and out from your inner circle, then you have an unlimited pool of people to pull from. So your sphere of influence, all the people who know you and trust you and made you business with you, that's what your sphere is. So it's pretty big. If you go to page 25, there's a chart there of my sphere. So it includes people in immediate family, friends, relatives, neighbors, past co-workers, hobby and sports groups, teachers for yours or your kids, churches, clubs, volunteer work, professional services like doctors and dentists and stuff, Bankers, insurance people, financial lawyers, um, those professionals, um, like the doctors, the dentists, the bankers, the insurance and financial people, um, in KW language, they call them um, allied resources. For me, I call them in my database B2B, business to business. Um, then there's, and that, there's personal services, hairdressers, there's home and auto repair, there's other real estate agents, mortgage and title appraisers, so people in our industry, and then others. So I want you to take um, a couple of minutes and write down at least one or two names of people you know in all of these different areas. Does everybody have a copy of that chart or do you need to put it up?
We've got a map where we've broken the entire city into zones. We like to target areas where we have fire. It's been scrubbed in the do not call list and it still represents over a quarter million phone numbers. All of our desks have three monitors. We have Mojo in the middle. We have our scripts on the right. And then on the left, we have some research on the desk. They're calling for stuff like that. Cold calling is like adding jet fuel to your car or something. Like it just, it pumps your business up. We went from making, what was our first year? Like 70K. And then this year, together, we have a million one. So this is Sean Point from the real estate creditors. You know what, I'm so sorry about Pete's today, but I just noticed that you, that you have to treat cold calling as though it's an appointment. If you don't prioritize it, things will always find their way in and block you from being able to do it. It's the most important thing you can do for your business. Absolutely most important, and you have to quantify it as well. The bold 100 contacts a week is a really, really cool way to set a bar, to set a bar and get started and stick to it. Whatever your decision is. Yeah, I was just wondering, is there any change in your plans? Are you still thinking this trade on the market? You can't think today was a bad cold calling day because today doesn't matter. What matters is what you accomplish in a year. And if you just keep adding people to your database and systematically follow up with them and take care of people who you work for, you'll do great. You're not always going to have great success every day, but it's by doing it every day that you have great success. We're going to be in the neighborhood for the next two who's getting free evaluations. You know what I'd love to do? Well, I'll say, too, that one thing that we were afraid of, and I think everyone is, is just the rejection side of things. People being mean to you on the phone and rude. We have the saying with our team that you're either part of our future or part of our past, and either way, it's fine. But the people who are rude to us are obviously not going to be part of our future. Have a chuckle about it. Like, honestly, when someone cusses at me or something, I just laugh because it's funny. Hey, do you think it would make sense for us to put some intention to the you guys? The more time you spend not on the phone, you're losing money because that three hours of my day is my 20% where I make my money. Don't get ready to start thinking about how you're going to eventually do something. Just do it. Like, just, just do it. Done. Stop watching this video. Just get off. <laughs> <laughs> See you later. Oh, just get on the phone. Yeah, and if you hate money, don't do it. Yeah. <laughs> These guys are really funny. I saw them at Asian Month last week. Well, that's they're, it. They were. They are real. Nice. They do do that. They have to ask. No, 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 no. When we did the mastermind um, panel last on, week, on last, last week, week, they were up there because we were talking about different lead generation sources. And so, you're going to... It, it is the 80-20 rule also in the type of lead generation that you choose. So you can't do it all, but you need to know what's out there and then pick two or three things that are effective for you and get really, really good at it. So for them, it was cold calling. They tried the door knocking, didn't work for them, the cold calling does. So if they decided that they're comfortable on the phone, and that's where they think they're going to get their results, you can see you know, by the screens, they're set up professionally to do it. And they master their scripts, and they do it over and over and over again, and they're getting the results, so they keep doing it. Other people, you know, it's open houses, or other people, like Arlene likes to door knock. What we're throwing out at you are all the possibilities, but you can't do everything all the time, or you'll pretty well get no traction on anything, and you won't get to master it. So pick what resonates with you and get really, really good at it, and get consistent at it. Um, on to the brothers. Uh, I, I, they have very short attention spans. <laughs> They're very, very high energy. I was actually surprised that they stopped door knocking because they were door knocking machines. But what I found out afterwards was they were only door knocking. They were not flyering, and they were not staying in touch with anybody. So they were only looking for people who wanted to move now. So they were cultivating it. They weren't doing any sort of that. But yeah, they also they said, they also said last week that when they started that, they did not have money to put gas in their cars. Remember that? Yeah. And now they did open bumper. So Irene, when you door knock, so you flyer first, then you door knock, and then you visit again. What, what is your? Uh, well, in the farm, in our farm, it's consistent flyering every three weeks and door knocking whenever I can. Just listed, just sold. It's not necessarily the same houses all the time. It's just knocking around new listings or new sales. They had started a very big farm. This, so this is just relating to a farm. So they were calling it a farm, but they were only door knocking. They weren't doing any sort of marketing. How big is your farm? 2,700. Do you still do the, um, the leaf bags? Yes. OK, I'm going to get back to that in a minute. Um, OK, so. <coughs> Now we're going to talk a bit about 
Great. So we, we talked about how to move out from your comfort level to maybe a wider sphere with those people. And then right. now there's the not met people things that you can do to okay. connect with people that you have no contact with currently. Um, but before we get to that exactly, we're saying lead gen for three hours, lead gen for three hours, lead gen for three hours. And I know in my mind, even though there's that time blocking schedule, it can get a little like, okay, well, well I call and then I got to follow up and then I want to get new business, but I don't want to lose the old business and I'm trying to incubate. And I've got, you're like, okay, what do I do? Um, so I thought it was really well and succinctly put on page 26, um, the three things that you should do in the three hours. So take 30 minutes to prepare. So that means Pull the call list of the people that you want to call and eventually give a database that can help generate that, all the better. Um, get in the game, so think about your big why and whatever it's going to do to get you up and, and make you feel like if this isn't a good day and somebody throws shit at you, I'm going to keep coming back because this is why I'm doing it. And then practice your scripts. You've got these people you're going to call. Take 15 minutes, go over it in your head, say it out loud, record it, and then get ready to get on the phone. So the two hours, the bulk of this is taking action. So it's talking to people and writing like quick updates, like this is what we talked about, or this is what I have to send them, and just keep going and keep going for two hours. And then the last half an hour is sort of your follow-up. It's when you Take Irene's sheets where she said, oh, wow, I contacted 15 people today, or I did, you know, whatever, track your results. Um, schedule the appointments, because I'm going to make appointments with people, so make sure that it gets into your day timer so you don't forget them. And then write your thank you notes. So go back to the people and say, okay, did I have to send things to people? Am I going to write notes? Take a half an hour to close it all out. That's what the three hours should look like. So when you're doing the prep your call list, be really purposeful with it. You know, if all of a sudden there's a, if you want to start building business through, um, I don't know, let's say seniors residences. I have my SRES, so I decided that I have experience with seniors. When I go to build new business, other than, you know, the people that I meet and I know that I'm talking to all the time, that's what I'm going to focus. So maybe you call five people in that realm every time you call. But be very purposeful when you make that list. And if all of a sudden you can't come up with any more names to call, then go back to all the different ways of prospecting and start a new one. Um, so on, when you're preparing and you're taking your 30 minutes to get ready to call, and you're finding that you don't have anyone to call, um, you can call your referrals, you can call your sphere, which is what we've been doing so far. Um, you can call for sale by owners, which we're going to talk about a little bit. Um, you can call lead from sign calls if you have a listing or around a listing. Um, you can do what's called circle prospecting, and that's, you know, you pick a geographical area that you're interested in, and you should actually get a systematic as mapping out, putting the map up, picking the streets, knowing how many people are there, and then every time a listing comes out in that neighborhood, regardless of whose listing it is, you contact those 60 people. And you know other brokerages like Royal B? Doesn't matter. And it's just like, and th this is kind of one of my things for this year, which is what I want to do. I want to get way more systematic about my farm because I've never really used one properly. And so I thought, you know what, I'm going to... As soon as the listing comes out, I'm going to find an hour's worth of houses on either side, and the day comes out, I'm like, oh, did you know your neighbor's listed down the street? I do have clients looking in the area, and this one is going to have an open house. Um, I took a look at the house. It's not all that great for my clients. Do you know anybody else who might be thinking of buying or selling? You know, do you keep track of this stuff? Do you want to know what it sells for? And then you just start. So it doesn't have to be your listing. But if you've got an area that you want to own, mm. Interesting. then have a purpose for getting out there. How do you find out how many homes are in a neighborhood? Uh, postal box. Postal. Go on to Canada Post, put in postal code, it'll give you the map, and then the map's total, uh, how many people, how many houses are. Yeah. 
categorize it yeah. for you, like if it's business, if it's apartment commercial, residential. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can get to that through Treb. It's under their store part. Services and services. Right there. Yeah. What is it? Yeah. Um, the postal walk. She was using Access to Canada post the postal walk. Yeah. 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 You can go to Canada Post website directly and put other things. Um, it is kind of important to, and this is how, when you get really good at prospecting calls and stuff, you have to write notes really quickly at the time you talk to them, but you don't want to write a whole book and you don't want to sit there and talk about it and then start writing your notes because you'll never get to the next call. So it's a fine line between writing the note, so if you get them, what do we talk about, and then right away, when do I want to call them next, then go to the next one. Because if you try to go back after you spoken to 15 people and saying, what did I talk about with this person? And then what was I going to do with that person? It's just easier to keep going. And the objective is to get better and better doing that faster and faster and using that time productively. The circle that you were talking about. Circle prospecting? Mm -hmm. Why do I need to know how many are in the area? How many houses? Why, do, why is supposed to Because if you're going to uh, only do that if you're trying to create a farm. Mm -hmm. So. There are statistics on, on sizes of databases and returns on database, so it has to do with predicting your income. So if you know that you're going to have about a 15% return, I think it's 15, I'll go back and check the numbers, but there's a whole section on setting up a farm, and it, it's usually about 2,000 um, names. I've got this right, you're going to get 15 deals off of that if they know you and you're talking to them. So if you're going to go and pick a listing in an area that you want to really get market share in, then be systematic about it, watch all the listings that come out in that area, and then you'll start to, you're going to want to start to build an inventory of everybody on those streets until you get those 2,000 names. And the best way to do that isn't, you, you can either start and say, okay, I'm going to door knock yeah, these three well. streets and then move through it, and you can say, um, okay, I'm doing a food no, drive, and that's how I'm going to cover these streets. Right. Or you can do the circle prospecting thing. Oh, okay. It's a little more random in how you're going to hit your farm. Yeah, okay. Okay. And then when you start to get deals off of it, then you can afford to flyer it. And then you can afford to just keep building it and spending the marketing side of it, not just the prospecting. But the marketing and the prospecting no. together is, is the most effective way to get the market share. What's a good number for the farm? Yeah. About 2,000. Yeah. 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 Um, and then and then the maintain part, which is your last half an hour, is your fulfill, fill, 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 um, the promises that you make to them. So if you say, I'm going to send you the app, or I'm going to send you some market information, or I'm going to send you whatever it is, you go back and you do the chunky monkey stuff at the end after you've written your notes and, and that type of thing. Um, okay, now, um, is this now making you feel a little more comfortable about still calling and finding new people and, and being able to keep the momentum going? All right, so we talked a bit about the farm, um, which is the door knocking part. Um, one thing that, uh, are there any other, the other thing, so you can go out around the listing um, or an upcoming open house. We've done the food drive thing in our office, which Adam organizes for us, and it's brilliant. Um, we often sometimes go out and door knock in our farms around Red Day because it's a feel good community thing if we're trying to get paint supplies or whatever it is. There are lots of reasons that you can come up with <coughs> to go back into your farm. Um, and I think if you want to, to get used to door knocking and get comfortable with it, Irene will always take you out. Um, and then on page 29, it says the obvious thing, don't be pushy. Um, and try and use that as an opportunity. <coughs> what I, I always like to go the little more indirect way. And so the script I used about who do you know who might be moving, 
I find works brilliantly because it doesn't put them on the spot. It doesn't make them feel like they have to do something. Yeah. Um, you, you know how connected they are to the ones a little gossipy, and they might go, oh, they're getting divorced over there, and you might want to go and talk to them. They're always happy to help you as long as it's, it, they don't have to do anything. Although they will say something if they are going to, you might luck out. Um, and then you have a reason to focus how you're hopping down the street. Um, and then when you go and talk to the other person and you say to them, you know, who do you think might be moving? They'll say, well, it's me because, so it can help you navigate the street as well and be focused on, on how you pick your spots. Uh, is there, um, would you suggest going to uh, door knock around and just list it or just sold in an area that you're not going to follow up with, like it's not in a, your farm? That, does that really um, relate to what you decided to be your farm? Um, it depends. <clears throat> Um, if you get a listing that's outside of your farm, oh, a listing, yeah, and it's, it's still a good area on there, but it's not in your farm, I'll door knock it. Yeah, sure. But if I get a listing because, like, the one up in Kleinberg, I'm not door knocking up there because I don't still want to be up there. I'm going to take my commission from that one sale and call it a day. My old coach from last time, he even Phil mentioned to me once, if, you're, if you don't have an area to pick and you don't know where to start, they always suggested to choose townhouses. Because most people in townhouses move every five years. It's kind of the middle step yeah. between, yeah. you know what I mean? So that may be a good place to start if you know townhouse, townhouse, building a village or something like that. Um, the only reason I was getting Irene here on the phone is because um, the next one that we're going to talk about in terms of approaching people you don't know are for sale by owners. And she's, she focused on that for a while, so I just want her to share her experience uh, with you on that. So I'm going to skip to the next one until she comes. Um, one that we all know, oh sorry, she comes. Lizanne, would you ever recommend, let's say, doing more than one farm area, if, especially if it's a smaller amount? Like you said, around 2,000 homes. But could I do like a, two different separate areas, not even attached, but 1,000 and 1,000? Would that work, or should I really stay in one locale, at least initially? Because like the brothers seem to be doing everywhere. I would I would suggest one locale, and when you really own that one, then go to the next one. Because there are other things, like if you really, really want to own an area, um, and especially, it's always, sometimes it's easy to do the one that you live in around you, if that works. If not, you can do a neutral one too. But you can get it down to the point where you're building a community within those those streets and you might want to set up a website that when you hand when your flyer does go out it's like oh you know if you've got a garage sale coming up post it on there so that everyone can see it like you can build a whole community if you're trying to do that twice with a smaller group it's twice as much work and it'll be i i, I just think it's easier to focus on one okay. until you've got the resources to do another one um the third way, which we all know and love, is open houses. Um, so if it is your listing and you are doing the open houses, it, it does make it that much easier to do them out because you're trying to invite them and then you get another opportunity to see them. Um, and when you have your open house, you know, then you also get the buyers out of it that you wouldn't get when you're just door knocking. Um, and you get the buyers who are also selling, so you might get two out of that. Um, but I'm not going to go a lot into open house and after that's a whole section on its own. Are we doing it at some point? Oh yeah, yeah there, there's a whole class on, on that. How to run it properly, how to generate those leads, yeah. What are the rules concerning, um, you have an open house in a condo. Mm -hmm. you can't, what are the rules concerning door knocking neighbors in a condo? Usually it's taboo. Yeah, that's right. Uh, most of the, because, yeah, usually don't door knock. Sure. Yeah. 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 What a fire? Yeah, you can flyer it, but don't you can door -door it. you can you can't flyer it walking down the hall and putting them right. because yeah. there have been agents that do that and they get really pissed off and the the residents and it doesn't usually bode well for you. Yeah, you can only flyer um, it by a postal walk. Exactly, you do it as a postal walk and it comes in their mail, and you've decided you're targeting this building, mm -hmm. and you're going to send them newsletters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but. 
they feel kind of violated when they know someone's been walking down the hall and got in through the security, yeah. especially if they're single women and that type yeah. of thing. Yeah. So, mm, yeah, no. That's what I thought. No. I Yeah, I, I, I don't know anyone that that's ever worked well for. Yeah. Um, I put a good contact once out of, I had a prospect that was looking for corner units. And I went to the, I went to the concierge and said, what are the numbers for the corner units? units, mm -hmm. four fives and eight yeah. ones and whatever, and then I, I just dropped off a letter to all, to 705, 805, yeah. 905, yeah. whatever, and the yeah. concierge would put it in the, yeah. in the mailbox. And that you can do, and if you live in a condo building, and then you're part of the condo board, and you start to get to know people, and you get a reputation for it, um, I know a lot of people that build business that way. I also have one building that I've sold lots of, like a few things in. So at least when I go to people, after I started one, and I thought, okay, well this isn't a bad building. So you can do the just listed and the just sold, and then if, if they start to see that you sold a fair amount in that building, um, then they'll call you too. But you don't do it quite as blatantly as you would on the street. Um, the other one that Irene touched on that can be a really good source of business, and I touched on it when, when I talked about, you know, not wanting to hook it up to Kleinberg all the time. You can focus your prospecting on building a network of agents, either in major cities in North America, major cities in Canada, other boroughs around Toronto that you don't want to hoof it out to. So it takes time to build these relationships. Um, but then, you know, when you do get a client, you send it out there and you get paid for that and they'll send them to you when they don't want to go into your turf. So, it's, it's a way of actually getting money for nothing, but it does require prospecting and managing and building those relationships just like if you were building with a banker or building with anybody else. And KW is wonderful because they've got the whole GPS system. If you go to family reunion, that's when you can actually meet the people that you've spoken to because so many of them go. So it's an indirect way of getting business, but it's a valid one too. It's just got a longer lead time. But it can make your life a lot easier if you don't want to go to certain areas. Um, and it does, it does generate business. And it can generate business through referrals where you're not really doing anything. Can you get referrals from like sending somebody in the states if someone at a client is interested? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Big time. It's usually yeah, it's twenty-five or thirty percent in U.S. dollars. Sorry. That's okay. Long conversation with the best client. Okay. I just wanted you to um, talk about your experience with Fizzbos because we were talking about not um, Mets, so I thought that you could chime in. Yes. Um, where do I start? Uh, I decided that for me and my prospecting region, uh, I would not have the foes that I would do, just because I have so many other things that I want to concentrate. Actually, that's not true. I have only three or four things that I want to concentrate on. So I didn't want to muddy the waters and divert myself or whatever. I but, but you did it. pick a point where you were going to focus on the one year. Yes, and absolutely, and I did it for about 18 months. What I was finding in our market was because things were moving relatively quickly, a lot of them were selling um, on on their own. Um, so which part would you like me so, to focus on? So I think what I wanted to focus on was we're throwing out a whole bunch of different things you can do. And your point about I have three things that I focus on. and. Every year when you go to do your budget and you're trying to figure out where your sales are going to come from, you look at those lead gen pillars and decide, you know, what's working for